All right, for those people that are in person, uh, welcome to Symposium 1, Distorted Constellations, uh, Interdisciplinary Perspectives on Understanding Reality and the Self. The speakers for the symposium are all joining us virtually, so I'm gonna turn it over to them to introduce the session to you further. When we get to Q&A portions of the talk, I'm gonna also be monitoring the in-person questions. So if you do have a question and when it's time for questions, just watch over to, uh, to the mic and I'll make sure that you're um, folded in alternating with um, virtual questions as well. All right, so we'll get started. Okay, thank you, um, Erica, and um, thank you for welcoming us to this session, Distorted Constellations, Interdisciplinary Perspectives on Understanding Reality and the Self. I will keep talking unless someone tells me that they can't hear me. Um, I do hope in Toronto that if you feel comfortable enough and want to wear a mask that you are doing so, I would highly advise that. Um, so, um, my name's Arima Ochu. I'm, a, I'm about to become actually an Associate Professor in Immersive Media at the University of West England. I'm until September at Manchester Metropolitan University in the Northwest of England. And my background is in neuroscience and I also trained as a storyteller. So I've, it's my great delight to be able to um, bring this interdisciplinary Com contributed symposia together with some very incredible um, artists and researchers. So um, the focus today, and I kind of wanted to kick us off by saying that we're going to have a series of talks, but we're going to have some conversation in between each talk that will make connections between the work of our artists, uh, Wando Ibizi and then there'll be opportunities for questions, which of course you can put your questions in the chat, we'll pick those up. Um, and I should say that for Francesca Paleda, who unfortunately is not with us today uh, because she had clinical commitments and some um, personal uh, challenges. So um, the session lasts roughly 90 minutes and um, I'm hoping that actually we might not take all of that time, um, but let's see where we get to. So to kind of introduce, um, our, our contributed con symposia. Um, the first thing that I wanted to say is that we want to kind of get you in a bit of a state of mind that will bring all of yourselves to this and to be really grounded in thinking about what you want to get from this session. And so if you can, do take a breath and then think about answering this question. And then I'm gonna introduce Wando. So the first kind of question, and I would love for people to put kind of answers in the chat, is to think about how far could you imagine the sky? How far could you imagine the sky? If you feel like it, I'd love you to share your answer and where you're located. And if you feel like it, your disciplinary um, specialism. It's not a trick question. It's just to get a sense of, of who's in the room and how we kind of all think a little bit differently. So yeah, I'd love it if people would uh, feel like they could um, drop that in the chat. If you're in the room, you might just want to, to write it down and we could hear about that a little bit later. Okay, so let's see, I'm gonna stop sharing now. And I'm going to introduce our, our first speaker. Um, so where are you? Where are you, Wando? Oh, hello. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> so Wando Azibi is a multidisciplinary artist whose work converges around art personas, experimental theater, neuroscience, music, and African diasporic ritualistic dance. Wando's unique strand of Afrofuturism and research into cognition is inspired by her neurodiversity and live art participatory practice. So we're going to hear from Wando's particular perspective on a condition uh, response, I would imagine, to a condition that's known as um, visual snow. It's a neurological condition. And in the literature, it says that it experiences augmented reality of auras, glowing lines, depression, anxiety, and depersonalization. Um, whilst visual snow can produce a collection of different symptoms, 
um, it has now been clinically recognized. And Francesca Polida, if she had been here, would say that people living with this condition were crucial for the diversity of this condition to be um, described and the symptoms to be described and, and the, the condition to be understood. So it was first described in the literature in 1995. Um, I'm going to hand over now to Wando, who's going to give us, bring us into her world and her lived experience of the condition through her work, Distorted Constellations. Hello, thank you. Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, I should first of all say that I'm sorry, but um, somebody's name was missed off that that first slide. And so um, Sophie Scott is also with us, who's a really important part of the team, has been an important part of this project. Um, OK, so I'm just going to share my screen. Um, and so we can begin. Nope. Nope. Yeah, of course, this is going wrong already. Stop share. Hmm. Sorry, having slight technical difficulty, which is, of course, what we want. So, we're going to just start this all again. Hey. So, share screen. That's looking good. Okay, we're good to go. So, I'm just going to play um, a little bit of footage and it's going to show you um, a clip of the piece that I created, Distorted Constellations, in one of its iterations. So in my work as a multidisciplinary artist, I create alternate realities and invite visitors into these worlds. One such project is the one that I'm sharing with you today, Distorted Constellations. You just saw a little clip of it there. You're going to see a lot more of it during this talk. Um, so the idea of constellation is a phenomenological approach that I have taken on for myself to kind of like spatially, physically understand my inner world and how it connects to the outer world. I have attempted to reach out of my own perceptual bubble to connect with others. And in the work that I do, revealing my own perception, I try and hold up a mirror to people for them to see their own. This constellation that I've created has invited in researchers from ritual practice, action research, and the cognitive sciences, each representing an aspect of my own personal way of making sense of the world. My perspective is post-colonial, it's neurodivergent, and it's interdisciplinary. I would sometimes describe myself as a natural philosopher. Um, and in this talk, I'm going to be sharing my approach to firstly understanding my own cognition through the cross-disciplinary sci-art way that I work. Um, I'm really interested in sharing how this could be a useful model for scientists and artists to work together to create citizen science, to create art as science experiment for the advancement of scientific understanding. And finally, I want to um, explore how vital it is that those that the science is about are included in its design, how it's studied and shared. And in that, I'm very inspired by the social model of disability, and I'm interested in creating provocations around the medical model of disability when exploring neurodiversity. So the piece um, really came from, from, from the idea of understanding that perception is a process of inference, making a best guess of what is out there in the world, given sensory inputs and our prior knowledge of the world. Um, I wanted to create this piece of art in order to help people understand that their limited window on reality was subjective. The desire was to create an immersive installation that would externalise my internal reality, demonstrating and normalising the subjectivity of perception. The project um, began in 2016 and runs to this day, and it offers a process and a way of approaching the world. 
it constellates layers of cognitive science represented by the different scientists that I collaborate with, moving from cellular through to the cognitive, psychological, out to society, public consciousness, with me in the centre as an important inner link with my lived experience of visual snow syndrome. Um, it uses augmented reality techniques to immerse and draw you into an altered perception, so to better understand the other, or to better understand the impossibility of fully understanding the other. Rather, to understand yourself as one on an infinite spectrum of possibilities. So, background to creating the piece. Um, as far back as I can remember, I've seen the world in a way that was apparently not the accepted norm. In 2014, this came to a head after a series of conversations with family and friends. When I began to ask them clearly, do you see what I see? And I'd ask, when you look at the sky, do you see the sparkling fizzy dots? When you look at the lights, do you see streams of light sparkling? And these were all questions that I'd asked as a child, but I'd never really received satisfactory answers. I went to see the optician and they confirmed that there was nothing that they could see wrong with my eyes. They couldn't explain the visual phenomena that I was experiencing. But still the people around me that I'd talked to up to that point were not experiencing the same reality. And often they'd suggest that I was mistaken, that I didn't see what I claimed to see, or that there was a logical explanation such as glitter that had fallen into my eyes. I mean, I was really interested in this misplaced argument from incredulity or the appeal to common sense. And it was something that I came up against again and again. And I found out it's really common for people with perceptual differences. So I began a search to find an explanation for what I perceived for, to explain my reality. And in that year, I found a paper that had just been written that, that really coined this condition, um, visual snow syndrome. And it's the first time I'd really found a clear description of how I describe an element of my reality. So, um, from the quote, that quotations from that paper there, um, and I approached one of the authors of that paper, um, Professor Goadsby, and began a research project into perception. Um, this began a string of projects where I was collaborating with scientists at art galleries, including at the Wellcome Collection in London, and that culminated with the creation of Distorted Constellations in 2019. So, what do I see? Um, it's a world full to the brim of glowing lines and shapes, whizzing, fizzing dots, auras that are glowing around, around all the objects in my visual field. When I experience sensory overload or stress or strenuous activity, the visuals can grow very intense and kaleidoscopic and can amass into pulsating geometric shapes. On a clear day looking at the sky, it seems like it's just full of trillions of fizzy dots. Um, you could describe it as um, a kind of transparent bluish TV static, um, or it might be described as a bit like a pointless painting. Um, when it all gets very intense, it can form into um, an optical migraine or a migraine aura and the sound might begin to kind of coalesce with the light and I could get a lot of pressure in my head. Um, so most people who experience visual snow syndrome also have a host of other symptoms, including um, star bursting, halos, auras, double vision, and these are some that I experience. And then there's also non-visual symptoms, some of which that I've tried to capture in some of the sound work that I've made. Um, ringing, humming, buzzing sounds, tinnitus, depersonalization, anxiety, brain fog, dizziness, there's, yeah, there's a whole load of symptoms. So inextricably linked to subjective perception, visual snow syndrome's manifestations, I think, offer a fascinating case for how neurodifference can inspire appreciation and understanding of diversity, sensation and unfixed realities. Visual snow syndrome is a never-ending refracting reality. It is a space full of spaces 
In all its amorphous blossoming, it contains universes of parallel realities, one filled to the brim with visual noise, a pointless painting come to life and spread across the sky, a landscape littered with landscapes. Its existence poses questions about the nature of reality. As an experience, it suggests a physicality to the intangible. Like a rumbling gif, it reveals the cross-modality of the senses. The world of visual snow is rich, never still, broken and breaking over and over again. There are layers of reality. Each speck of dust has its shadow self. Each spot of light in time has its sister spot of light in the past. Past is overlaid onto future, reality augmented. Visual snow is a labyrinth, offering the person submerged within its walls a never-ending journey. It is a framework for stories to tell yourself about yourself. Illness, neurodiversity, magic, sci-fi, all are possible mythic palettes from which to paint the colours of your own story. It is a patina, rough and raw, scratched across your eyelids that reveals something of yourself. A mark, it says, is this what the brain is? Is this how the brain works? I'm aware that I hold contrasting realities in my mind at the same time. In a way, I've always known that the visual phenomena were both like there and not there. Kind of like how when I lucid dream, um, I'm aware that I am asleep, but I'm somehow conscious. And one question that's come up for me is, could this have led to a unique way of relating to reality? And is there something interesting in this to share? As a multidisciplinary artist, I work across many different art forms, installation, sound, performance, and ritual. And this project was designed within the fields of immersion, utilizing virtual reality, augmented reality, and mixed reality, because I think VSS as a phenomena is an interesting analog to all these technologies. So I think it tells us not only interesting things about how the brain works and how reality is perceived, but also could hold interesting ideas for scientists and technologists and philosophers to collaborate. Visual snow is a revelation of an unknown world, a parallel universe living side by side, revealing that we all inhabit our own just within reach of the next person. It's a denial of absolutes. There is no black for somebody with VSS. Indeed, a common cause for very real distress for people who have a sudden onset of VSS is the fact that they will never again see the colour black. And there is no white, equally. Apparently, I've never seen those colours. There's just no opacity. All of space and matter and stuff are connected by a never-ending stream of content, information, world without end. Reality is slippery. Visual snow is a piece of electronic music. Trees echo birds reverberate, light saturates, air coalesces into analog static. who experiences visual snow realizes that reality is constantly being repeated, matter distorting and bending, and she creates herself. She finds visual snow syndrome at the intersection of ritual myth and neuroscience, and so a phenomenological approach makes sense. She sees herself repeated a second behind herself. Another self is next to herself. The other self is another possibility of what one could be. It is self in a parallel dimension. If she had only... She sees her mirror self in an infinite regress of possible possibilities. Visual snow is an ocean. It is a black Atlantic, a sea of possible interpretations, double consciousness, a world teeming with mysterious sensory information, a dream within a dream. Visual snow is a ghost plane, a wasteland of broken fragments. The ghost fragments dance and fade, play like spectral children, and half-forgotten melodies are haunting. Visual snow is a time machine. Visual snow is a shadow land, a distorted mirror world. Of all these things is, I made a piece of work about. To see if I hold up the mirror to others' perceptual realities, held them up against mine, what would they see of themselves? What could they understand about the subjectivity of reality.
so I'm <laughs> circling to a point. I think I think this is this is the constellation for me. It's it's really constellating all these areas and ideas. Um, but to, to try and sum it up, I think the ideas behind it were really about encompassing this phenomenological approach to the to accessing the concept of reality. I wanted to see how I can create an immersive tech piece of sci art that could do the following. It could give an experience of a neurodivergent reality, creating a neurodivergent led space. It could create art as science experiment. It could create a playground where scientists can become artists and artists can become scientists and participants, engaging in the scientific process through creative workshops, ritualized site art performances and immersive provocations. And I wanted to offer a real contribution to the current landscape of neurodiversity research. I also wanted to demonstrate and normalize the subjectivity of perception, creating opening points for people to, to discover perhaps that they have VSS in a safe space where there's information about where to go next. I've also tried to create pockets of community for people who have VSS to feel seen, heard and understood. As is common for many neurodivergent people, VSS sufferers can report high incidents of depression, anxiety and other debilitating hidden psychological issues. And so I hoped sharing my explorations of the condition creatively and demonstrating the positive impact it's had on my mental health could help others. The exhibition as festival, the installation as research project, would also provide conversations with researchers working in cognitive science um, where the neurodivergent could find creative ways of expressing their own neurology. So we've already talked a little bit about how it's functioned as a research project in the multiple respects across its iterations. In the iterations in Manchester, Brighton and London, we also had a sensory space where people could spend a lot of time, they could write, draw, paint and talk to an access artist. Over 50,000 people have experienced distorted constellations so far in person and online um, and that's been a really diverse range of people um, and people have reported um, also their own neurodiversity within their communications with us. Um, there's also been um, a wide range of people with different disabilities and we've collected lots of information in the form of drawings, writings, essays and doodles. We've also recorded written um, and, and vocalised responses. So it's been really helpful to know that it actually exists. I'm, I'm really grateful that this exhibition has happened and there's been a neurologist talking about it and hopefully more people will recognise that this is what they have. I mean, it's really difficult to gauge how other people who don't have it might perceive all those things. It was a really stressful my, under microscope version of, of sometimes um, the way I perceive my visual snow. I, um, I found out I had visual snow about a year ago. It happened really suddenly for me. Um, and it really made me question um, if I could still be a practicing artist. Um, I'm a theatre designer. Um, and I, I, it made me think that I couldn't, um, I couldn't produce something because my vision of the world was. Um, I question my vision of the world so much more than I have before, and how could that be relevant for other people? Um, so coming here today has been incredible because um, I've seen someone who has visual snow who's created an incredible, like a really like um, an immersive installation that's really effective. I think I found it really moving and effective. My parents did as well, and like they don't suffer from visual snow at all. And I've seen a lot of people here today like enjoying that and, and responding to the work. So it's make, making me feel like I can do it too. You know, I'll go out there and I'm gonna pursue my artistic career with aplomb, so thank you very much. <laughs> um, in the London iteration, we also had an action researcher who conducted a project and wrote a paper interrogating the visitor's experience of neurodiversity, accessibility, as well as the impact of this form of research on the experience itself. In Manchester, Brighton and London, there were a series of talks, workshops and happenings led by artists and scientists to explore in depth the sources, knowledges and possibilities that came to and from the exhibition.
In London, I invited Sophie Scott and writer Joe Muggs to co-present a salon. The approach was to layer ritual actions inspired by ASMR, Autonomous Sensory Meridian Response, in order to bring people into a relaxed state to make them gently open to suggestion and intimacy. So here you can see um, some of the people lying down, they're very relaxed. There's also performers enacting ritual actions, including touch, also cooking some pancakes, which went down very well. Um, so so this, this kind of performative ritualized approach was, um, was, was layered underneath the conversation with Sophie about neurodiversity, reality and the self, which she will talk about a bit more in, in a while. Um, and the hope was the mixture of these technologies, approaches, would permeate layers of defence against perceived ideas of difficulty or the abstract abstractness of cognitive science, leaving people more open to receiving the ideas. Um, and finally, in, um, in the Science Gallery in Melbourne, which was the last iteration of the show that we presented, um, Simon Cropper um, and I conducted a, a research and Simon will be sharing more detailed information into the study that we conducted later on. Of fundamental importance to this whole journey has been finding ways to make the work accessible for others and myself. I wanted to create an exhibition and a project that would be a way of continuing to discover my own brain, my own needs and myself. Um, in last year, in 2021, um, I created um, Distorted Constellations Volume 2, which was this online iteration of it, um, a 360 degree video environment that can be ac accessed on social media. Um, audiences are invited to locate representations of their own perceptions and engage with new possibilities and share their experiences across social media. And this was made in collaboration with designers, filmmakers and technical experts and used spatialised sound. And we can see a little bit of it. Um, this is an... Unfortunately, this isn't in um, 360 degrees because it's a, I don't, I don't know why I couldn't show it, but you can see some of the visual snow symptoms that were made there. And, oh, and these are all versions of me dancing. Um, yeah. So that, that's that. Um, we also made um, a visual snow syndrome filter for Instagram. Um, and the filter allows the users to layer their own surroundings with a selection of visual snow syndrome effects through their phone camera. And it also has audio um, symptoms. Um, the, the interesting thing for me with this is was using augmented reality to signal the, poten the potential of these kinds of filters, which are all in common use as a useful tool to better understanding and potentially even diagnosing visual snow syndrome. And you can see this is a little um, video example of, of what it looks like to look through a feet into a field. So one of my questions in creating this project has been around empathy, my own understanding of it versus the scientific framing of the word versus people's general understanding of it. Um, what is it to try and evoke one's perceptual experience? Can it build empathy? Can people feel a connection to someone else's perception? Um, I found that people definitely see themselves in the mirror of the work, but equally people reported feeling a sense of the impossibility of empathy. They might have realised for the first time how impossible it is to truly inhabit somebody else's perceptual reality. Being in that uh, installation, in that space, you can feel other people feeling as well. So this is the reason that I recommend people to come and to see, to share their feeling, uh, you know, with each other. So to, to kind of bring this to a close, um, I would say Distorted Constellations uses augmented reality techniques to immerse and draw you into an altered perception, so to better understand the other or to better understand the impossibility of fully understanding the other. Its knowledges of neuroscience, myth and ritual combine to offer a neurophenomenological perspective as well as an Afrofuturist landscape towards transformation. It raises questions for us all. 
Um, given the problems in our world created by extremist thought, entrenched biases, are there ways for artists and scientists to collaborate on research to create spaces for changing behaviour? What could happen if people outside the scientific community could understand the subjective nature of reality? What can VSS as a perceptual difference reveal to developers in technology, to designers of new realities? Is it possible to separate the disease from the idea of neurodiversity, i.e. following the social model of disability, to treat the debilitating symptoms whilst accepting a difference in perception? And what difference could that make to the patient psychologically? How could this lead to a difference in treatment for people with perceptual differences or sensory sensitivities? And finally, how can we utilise the tools of art in diagnosis, in understanding the self and in understanding reality? Thank you. Thank you, Wando. I wanted, I wanted to um, now invite um, Professor Sophie Scott, and I have just updated our, um, what we were provided, um, because obviously um, Professor Sophie Scott uh, leads the Speech Communication Lab at the Institute of Cognitive Neuroscience at University College London in the UK. Sophie is a cognitive neuroscientist whose research is focused on the neural basis of vocal communication, how our brains process the information in speech and voices and how our brains control the production of our voice. I'm going to hand over to um, Sophie to give her talk and, and welcome her to the stage. And then there's going to be um, some questions and discussion between Wando and um, Sophie. Um, who's been collaborating with Wando. Thank you very much, Jermyn Man. Thank you very much, Wando, for that presentation. And um, I'm just going to share my slides. Yeah. Sound on. Brilliant. What I've done here is I've forgotten that I've got my slides right at the start. So let's go back to the beginning. My turn. To... Fantastic. So um, I'm going to talk about neurodiversity and neural difference, and, and I'm not really going to be talking about um, the sort of intense uh, experiences that can be associated with what get sometimes considered to be, you know, sort of, for example, developmental disorders or issues. Um, but I'm expanding it out into um, just thinking about difference and what we can learn in neuroscience and cognitive science by em embracing difference and, and listening to the difference. So, for example, a very kind of common way of thinking in my area of cognitive neuroscience is to think you know let's let's look at brain areas that are processing speech and kind of group everybody in there but because what we're interested in are the brain areas that are in common to everybody and you can do that and you can find some interesting areas that's not an interesting thing to do but when we start looking at individual differences beyond that what we tend to do is still think in a very kind of linear way so we look for a a, a sort of a spectrum along which people vary and then look for brain areas that vary along those same kind of parameters and I think it may be worth again that's a very important thing to do but I think also sometimes things can just be different and I think thinking about those differences and actually the best way of capturing those and thinking about those has been very interesting for me um, primarily actually see opportunities I've had to work with people like Wando people who are artists and who have kind of guided how I've developed a study based on their experience of what they do. Um, so I just want to start with an example of this. So here are the brain systems that are recruited when you do what I'm doing right now, and that's speaking aloud. It's an incredibly robust brain system. You tend to find very similar areas in everybody. You get auditory cortex activated, sensory motor cortex, classic Broca's area, the left inferior frontal gyrus on the left and you get some cortical fields. It's so robust that you can sort of see something very similar when you just put one person in the scanner. But what are they saying? What is the speech? That's never the stuff that gets involved in these studies. We're just, you know, they're often just naming words or answering a question. There's nothing very kind of uh, 
representative or sort of um, uh, complex in how we're thinking about the speech in these contexts. And this is actually a study that I did some years ago now, where the first artist I ever worked with, a, a voice artist called Duncan Wisby, and he is a professional impressionist. He does impersonations of people for radio programs and television programs. And this is an interesting shot here. Here's, here he is in the UCL anechoic chamber. And what he's doing is he's making recordings of his voice. So he's doing different impressions here. You'll notice, however, although what we're recording is his voice, he's changing, he's, he's doing hand movements. He's, he's doing different things with his eyebrows. He's changing a lot about his body that doesn't directly affect what he sounds like. And I was interested in what this meant in terms of his, what was happening in his brain. And in fact, he designed the study that we went in to then go into fMRI and see what's happening when he does change his, change his voice. I have to say, his voice vocal expertise is quite extraordinary. This is just a very quick clip of his vocal tract doing some different, um, turning the sound down because it's a bit loud at the start. He's just going from his very deepest voice up to his highest voice and then back down again. So these aren't impressions, this is just vocal difference. Larynx is right down the bottom there. And it's going up and up and up and up and up and up. So we're seeing somebody there with a tremendous kind of flexibility in their vocal range. And in the scanner, we just asked him to say the same thing over and over again, either in his own voice or doing a, a, an accent or doing a particular individual. And because the results were so interesting, we repeated the whole study with people who are just people, not, not vocal impressions, just people who have a go at changing their voices, people like me who are happy to have a go at doing an impression of somebody. And when we do that, what you find in non-experts is you get a greater activation of the brain than you see just for talking aloud, all those areas I showed you before. And particularly, you start seeing right areas in the right side of the brain recruited, which when you're listening to speech, are actually very much more interested in who's talking than they are in what's being said. So we're seeing probably people seem to be thinking about the sound of the voices they're trying to achieve when they're do changing their voice to do this. You see something very, very different when Duncan was doing an impression. Instead, what you see, that's him talking aloud. And here in the bottom right, these are the brain areas activated when he's doing an impression. And they are not the same as what we find in the non-professionals. He is showing activation in brain areas to do with the movement of his hands and also in basically in visual imagery. So he's thinking about what people look like and how they move. And that's how he's actually accessing a different sound to the voice. This is a completely different kind of acting approach to someone like this is actually the, the actor uh, Julian Ryan Tutt, who I did a project with for the Wellcome Trust, and he was very interested in what happened when he was performing. So in this study, he wanted to see what's different when he was acting and he read the poem The Expiration by John Donne about a lost love, and he either read it in a very neutral voice or he properly performed it. And what you see up here is just what it looks like when he's speaking in his normal voice. And down here, this is when he is acting, he's reciting the poem. And if we compare the two, what you find, again, very differently from Duncan, all the activation is coming up here at the top of the brain in areas to do with the representation of the body. And he, his words was, when he was acting this piece, he felt it. He felt that emotion, he felt that loss. And there is a theory in emotional processing that says we map out emotions in our physical body. And he seems to actually be accessing this when he is performing in this way. A different, completely different kind of vocal performer. Here we have um, a beatboxer beatboxing. And this, um, this is completely serendipitous. Uh, I've been doing the work with my, with my vocal impressionists and my um, postdoc, Carolyn McGettigan said, you know, we should do all this with beatboxers as well. So she went to the UK beatboxing championships and some sort of shouting, can we scan your brain to, uh, to beatboxers? And Reap Swan, a very, very talented beatboxer, said, yes, please. And he's been working with us ever since. This is Reap Swan or Harry F in the scanner. So this is just looking at his vocal track. Look, look at the sheer range of movements that he's making. It's absolutely extraordinary. I used to think that speech was the most complex sound in, in nature until I encountered beatboxers who are just starting to probably truly explore the possibilities of what the human voice can do.
so for example when you study phonetics you get taught that uh, when we speak we can make a we make a kind of constriction at one point in the vocal tract and at any one point in time that's the sort of the speech sound that you're making but you can only make one harry at the end there was making at least three different sources of sound he was making a noise at his larynx he was making a noise at the back of his um at the back of his nasal cavity kind of nasal harmonics and he was also making noises at his lips and he's controlling those three pitches separately so beatboxers did not study phonetics and don't know they're not supposed to be able to do this when we take this into the scanner i think we're seeing something qualitatively different from those two different acting approaches because effectively harry f is doing something different when he beatboxes because he's an extremely fluent and skilled beatboxer here's just a comparison between him and a novice beatboxer full disclosure that's me i can't beatbox and here i am having a go what you're actually seeing is something that looks like an expert brain here in harry's brain you're seeing activation in that's much tighter in many brain areas but he's also for example doing much much more in the cerebellum than me because he's coordinating many more complex actions and i just want to finish with another kind of music so i think one of the things that working with artists has made me realize about the human voice is that that is still a form of music the human voice is a musical instrument that we've kind of repurposed for speech and language very effectively but it never loses that musical aspect and this was um, from an opportunity that i had to work with uh, musician and composer David Arnold and here we were looking at him listening to music but critically he was listening to music that he absolutely loved now music activates the brain a great deal when you're listening to music a lot of your brain is processing because there's a lot going on there's rhythm there's pitch there's vocals and you get emotional responses and physical responses to the rhythm and this is just from a, a review paper kind of picking out brain areas that are involved when you listen to music you also get reward networks activated if you listen to something that you like here, I'm going to show you David's brain. This, sorry, this is just David Arnold's brain. One thing I, I really did strike, I have not talked about brain structure at all. So I've just been talking about brain function. But one of the things we couldn't miss when we scanned him is he has an absolutely enormous primary auditory cortex. And I'd love to know more about musicians and composers and this kind of structural aspect. Um, this is David's brain when he listens to music that he loves. And importantly here, the contrast is just music, music that's not of any particular interest to him. And this is really important because we've subtracted away from this contrast, just hearing music. What you're seeing here is him hearing the activation that's extra to hear music that he absolutely adores. And you're seeing, if anything, so much more activation than just to music itself. It's, it's activating memory areas. You're seeing very strong activation in retrospinal cortex. You're seeing very strongly bilateral activation, lots of frontal activation not so much visual activation not so much sensory motor activation but this is something that and in fact the music people do seem to have learned this a lot sooner than everybody else you do see different networks activated to music if you let people listen to music that they love so i think again listening listening to people leaning into the differences thinking about what you can learn from exploring how people experience their own skills or perceptions and letting that lead you in the direction of research can really help you i think help us start to build a much wider model of how we can and should perhaps be exploring neurodiversity in the brain instead of looking for brain areas and nice little spectra let's go on a journey that acknowledges sometimes difference can just be different and let's let's find out more about that let's celebrate that thank you fantastic um going on a journey um Let's bring back uh, Wando to uh, come with your questions for Sophie. Hello. Hi. Hey, Sophie. How are you doing? I'm doing well, thank you. Thanks so much for that. Um, first of all, it just looks like you've just got a really exciting life, meeting really cool people. <laughs> I cannot lie to you. One of the one of the most enjoyable parts of this job is just the different interesting people and their interesting brains that I get to work with. I've learned they've all been brilliant. I've learned something from all of them. So, I mean, I guess I mean, one thing I was wondering when when what watching that, I mean, so um, I mean, is this is this typical? Is it typical to work like this? No, um, I think be because because the brain imaging techniques that we have they often are you know you often need to have more than one person to be able to see the data so you tend to go pretty conservative you look for group data 
you don't look for single individuals and if you do look for individual differences you look along a, a linear parameter that's you know what brain areas are affected by this correlate with this behavioral score for example or this clinical score so i think it is it is unusual and i think um i probably to the extent to which i do get away with it which you might argue i don't i have done a lot of the really kind of conservative stuff where i've looked for here at brain areas we find in everybody here are kind of linear variations um but i think it's i've learned so much from simply letting people you know letting the artists i've worked with drive the direction in which we take the study what what they what answer they want to know about from their insight into what they do has has led to completely different studies than i would have devised on my own and that i think has a real advantage to it i think there are definitely don't stop doing the kind of small c conservative stuff because that that's telling us about the networks that and they're fundamentally how they work but to but really to be able to kind of grapple with difference i think you can i think we should let ourselves acknowledge that sometimes difference is just difference and it may not have a meaningful relationship to something else let's just look into what that thing is let's try and relate that to people's own lived experiences which might just be one person and i mean do you have any thoughts on on how like how your approach and way of working can come more into uh, a wide way of working for other for other researchers um well you know i've i've done the due diligence i've also published papers um you know kind of with the artists and we've and those tend to be more not just look at this crazy brain but you know something that's got you know got more participants in it and is um and it's more uh kind of fitting within a traditional scientific publishing format but I do also put these other examples when I give talks I'll say look that's not the whole story because look at this you know here's the music network but look look what happens when people listen to this guy listens to music he absolutely adores it's different and I think that's um hopefully you know scientific change is slow and the whole system is conservative but there used to be a a tradition of kind of natural history in how we engage with scientific publishing and I kind of still hanker for that in my heart I am a natural historian that I like I do observational science I'm much more interested in finding out about what's out there than in running an experiment you know what I do is almost always observational and I think that they there, there should be a place for this. If you look at the development of neuropsychology, which is a, an area that was completely built up on people studying individual patients and looking at how their changed experiences and issues following strokes or head injuries related to, you know, uh, things that they know they still had no problem with or how that related to their brain injury. And that was always completely based on single cases. And it's been in a tremendously valuable area for understanding the human brain and human experience. So I think we could do something similar here. It's a sort of, you know, like a natural history and neuropsychology of the of the brain that is being driven by by working with people with different experiences or different skills and i think i think that's one of the reasons why we we really connected because we probably see ourselves in slightly similar ways in that way like i'm I'm an artist as well but yeah definitely that that natural historian like natural philosopher approach is what really excites excites me because because yeah, all all you need is some is some type of perception to 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 do that, and then and just to and to, to delve into it. And so, yeah, I was wondering if you could talk a bit about how like how how we've connected and how like your your way of working has like related to 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 my projects. Um, well, I I was really blown away by your distorted constellations uh, exhibit, and it was. I really enjoy getting to see it again, just sitting on this screen. It felt um, felt like something from a dream that night. And I, I don't think I've seen somebody do such an interesting kind of reinterpretation of their experience, but in a physical space where it was at the same time beautiful and mysterious, but also, you know, you want you, your curiosity was piqued. You wanted to go in there. You wanted to find out more, but also it was being completely valid to your own experience so you were putting a version of that out that you weren't sort of trying to replicate it for people but people had the opportunity to start engaging with a version of an idea of what to see the world through your eyes might mean so 
I thought it was it was really lovely because it was beautiful and it was artistic but it was a, it was a scientific enterprise it was your you were making this available for people to go into an experience and to and to actually perceive elements of that so I thought that was really really fascinating so I really like how you you're well you're a polymath you know you're just working across so many different disciplines and you somehow managed to pull up something so coherent from that oh. and accessible but as I say remaining sort of just beautiful and engaging and as we saw from the examples of people talking about it that people have really profound experiences when they engage with that thanks <laughs> Um, I, yeah, I mean, do you have any questions for me? Or um, so them? would you think if somebody said, right, we've scanned you, Wendo, and these are the brain areas that are different in your brain from somebody else's brain, would that be of even any interest to you at all? Or would you want to know more than that? Would you it's just do you want to see the difference or do you want to... Would you want to say, okay, now let, let's see what happens in my brain when I do this? Oh, man, I, I, would, I, 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 love, I love getting in a scanner. <laughs> so it makes a great noise. I find it very relaxing. I'm, I'm a bit weird like that. Um, so I'd, I'd, I'd love to do that anyway. But um, I'm, I'm, I'm really curious about the populations who've been in scanners. So where the kind of baselines are coming from. And um so i think that's that's my my first thought about comparing yeah. um i mean maybe you could tell tell me about that do you feel like there's been like a like a global kind of enough of a global representation of of of, of scans yeah well it, i mean it hasn't been because you know the classic thing in psychology is that our our participants are weird you know they're white educated that they're very they're not from a very diverse of people in fact and i didn't talk about this but i did publish a paper with harry f the beatboxer where we just looked at beatboxers electric guitar players and non-musicians listening to music and looking at how people's brains engaged when they heard the instrument that they could play and that was the first study i've ever done where because of the groups we were recruiting we were recruiting people that didn't weren't either doing degrees or had degrees and weren't all white and yeah. middle class so it's so the baseline is it's an important point but i suppose what i was trying to push you into saying because say i want you to i've got a dog in this fight i think you probably could investigate your brain doing things without needing a baseline at all the baseline okay. could be you yeah i yeah i'd love to be the baseline <laughs> i'd love to be a baseline um so I think that that would be how I would take it because it's it's always an issue. What what's the comparison? And if you say okay, well if the comparison is just the person themselves and what we're going to look like with Duncan when mm -hmm. he's talking or doing an impression, he was his own baseline there, and that's giving us and that did show us something fundamentally different from what we saw with with non professionals, and it does seem to be through how his experiences or how he was born or maybe actually probably through his music all, mm -hmm. all the impressionists i've ever met are musicians um oh. he's just engaging with voices he hears voices differently and when he thinks about how to be someone through their voice he's thinking about the whole person to get to that he's not break i thought i thought impressionists would be like phoneticians and they'd break speech down into lots of little pieces and then build it all up again and i literally couldn't have been more wrong but I only see that when I treat him as his own control. I mean, I think I think that's so interesting, and and yeah, I totally hear what you're you're saying. This, it's I guess it's it's like it's quite a new idea for me. This idea that the, yeah, you could they, they, they could just be me, and then and what the brain scan says is that it says things about me <laughs> specifically, <laughs> which and um, but 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 yeah, to speak, to, ugh, it's so interesting. I mean, it's oh, it's a bit of a deviation. But in terms of artists, I just I think I think any kind of art is inherently physical. So that, that also doesn't kind of mm. surprise me. That that yeah, that I would assume that I I think everything that I do, if I'm making music, if I'm if I'm thinking up an idea, it's I feel it as a very physical thing. Yeah, which is probably one of the reasons why I want to physicalize things in in space. And yes. I, I've got I've just got a very strong connection to to spatialization. Yeah. So I work a lot with spatialized music, and 
I, I, I wondered if that's also because I've, I've just got a sense of space that might be different to a lot of people because it's it's full yeah There's no such thing as empty space yeah yeah and I think that's entirely possible I don't I mean I sometimes think that um I don't want you to get the impression that I think the only way we could explore this would be through looking at your brain I think brain's very interesting but brain scanning remains a very blunt tool and it's not very good as an example for unless we got some really good immersive VR into the scanner, which remains not completely possible, but you know, you'd know, you still be t stuck in a tube. So looking at you and your reaction to space would be harder to do with a lot of our traditional techniques. Not impossible with some uh, more mobile techniques that people are developing, but if you wanted to answer, what I'm saying is we wanted to know about your brain and space, we would actually really want you to be engaging with those spaces, wouldn't yeah. we? Um, so they're going to see if there's any questions. Yeah, if we could go to uh, Erica in Toronto to see if we've got any questions from the floor for this section of the uh, symposia. So questions for, for Sophie and Wando. Anybody here in the auditorium want to come to the microphone to ask a question? Now is a good time. You can also bump to questions in the chat. If there are any there. Oh, we have one question, yes. So, yeah, very interesting uh, talks. Um, I was wondering when you create those visual effects, how do you uh, make sure that they are, people feel the same way that you feel like uh, in these, uh, when you see the visual snows in your visual field? Because how do you communicate? Uh, do you have other people to? Uh, help you calibrate. Thank, yeah, thanks for the question. I think, I, well, I think first of all, there's, um, I, I, I don't know how I always feel. I think it's, it's a really, I think one of the things that I feel about about this whole piece that I've learned through the, the, it's been a real struggle making it because it's trying to create a version of my perceptual reality, and it's just impossible. Um, you know, with all with all the senses that we have, it's really complex. And and having visual snow syndromes, one element, it's just one slice of my perceptual reality. So how I and how I feel about it changes all the time, and it cha it's changed in response to making it. So I feel like it's really complex. Um, and I'm I'm really really okay with the idea that people have their own responses to it and feel how how they feel. Um, I've I've definitely found commonalities. People, because I've been at most of the exhibitions, and people have come and talked to me about it. And people have had feelings of feeling very similar to me, or feeling very opposed, or, or just had completely different ideas. You know, I mean, that's the the art element of it as well. It's definitely not a. Um, it's I've found that it's an impossible and interesting challenge to try and create something that is. Um, shared it's 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 a type of shared experience but it's it's really diverse it's a really diverse experience does that yeah does that answer yeah yeah thank you very much thank you perhaps whilst we um have sophie i do know sophie that you do have to go um one question um for me so my background is in neuroscience and i've made this journey from neuroscience into the arts and humanities as a space to kind of work with immersive experiences and like you love working with artists and hearing from artists um one question on your side is um obviously you're you're a professor um that initial route in to having the courage to kind of work in the way that you're working, where did that come from? And in a way, the same question to Wando, you know, the courage to be able to work in a way where you're kind of going against the grain, essentially. So, you know, coming from the social model of disability, um, wanting that difference is accepted. And Sophie, on your side, in thinking about um, science as, you know, having this norm normative perspective, um, and you know, a control of one that sounds unheard of, um, but very interesting. So, what what was the what gave you the confidence to um, go in that direction? Um, I back in two thousand and seven, I'd come back from maternity leave, and I was feeling a little bit invisible, and 
you do kind of I think probably taking leave for any amount of time and then coming back for any reason you do sort of think oh have people forgotten about me and we had brain awareness week coming up and I said at work we were trying to decide what our, our plans are going to be and I said I'd, like, I'd really like to do something and so it kind of stemmed from me wanting to sort of be seen if you want to a better phrase and what I wanted to do I thought what I'd I thought for a while I wanted to get hold of the brain of an impressionist. I wanted to find out more. I wanted to talk to them about it. And it's actually very hard to get hold of impressionists because they're really busy. So I stalked several online. And in the end, I got hold of Duncan through um, for a lot of circuitous route. But he was interested and got back straight in touch with me. And we continued working. We were just doing something the other weekend up in Blackpool. And I think... It, it, I can't, it's no exaggeration to say that that experience changed everything for me. It wasn't like the being seen at work part sort of disappeared. And I just got so caught up in realising he reframed everything that I'd ever thought I knew about voices and speech and drew out the music in voices, the, the emotional connection to voices, all of these ways of talking about voices. And that's even before we got to him and how he was changing his voice, what he was actually doing in his brain and his vocal tract. So that was the sheer fascination of it and the fact that no one had ever ever looked even at different ways of things that we might you know reading aloud is different from talking right now and we just hadn't really even asked those questions in my area at all so for me it just seemed like a like it, it, it's no exaggeration to say it changed everything and that made it um something that i was keen to keep doing and it is true to say every single time I've worked with an artist, it is as informative and as exciting for me as every time I've worked with, you know, I've, I've done a lot of work in neuropsychology and I've worked with people with who've had brain injuries and I've always, you know, very grateful and honoured they spend their time with me and I've learned, always learned a great deal about the brain from working with them and it's as much, if not more, from working with artists. It just reframes and re, what I thought I knew, it makes me think differently about and that's just exhil exhilarating once you've started doing it and I've had to continue. That sounds fascinating. And and you talked very briefly about virtual reality. You, the, the experience with Wando was around kind of all, Wando, you call it augmented, uh, an augmented reality experience in essence. Are you doing stuff with virtual reality? Um, are you thinking about that as a kind of tool for, for doing your, um, your work? That's a question for Sophie, right? Or me? For, for both of you. Okay. I would love to. Particularly, I mean, Nwanda and I, Wanda and I have talked about this before, but the, um, you know, I'm interested in ASMR and how kind of sound and space and tactile sensation are processed in the brain and being able to explore kind of different environments and sounds in a controlled way, in a way that you could take into the scanner would just be amazing to be able to do that. But what would you think, Wando? Oh my God. I mean, I think it'd be so amazing. I mean, my, my feeling about um, sort of virtual reality, which is, you know, it's the, the full reality is that um, I, I'd, I'd be so curious to see how the, how a brain is, is behaving, how a brain looks in virtual reality compared to, to re real, real reality. Um, and, I, and I would guess that it, it would really, really vary for people I, I bet it's it, it's not similar at all like i know that for me when i experience virtual reality um because i feel i'm in a kind of augmented reality all the time um my, the, the the visuals are very um overwhelming i think i'm i'm probably mm. a case for like someone who's very susceptible to virtual reality like if i have a headset on for too long it does something very strange to my sense of self mm. um so i'd i'd be so fascinated to what you could ex explore and, and i think the interesting thing is that even if you created a realistic version of virtual reality i still think it would reveal something different to, to, to real reality yeah <laughs> calling it yeah I completely agree. I completely agree. That sounds like a, a new collaboration forming right there. Fantastic. Okay. Um, Sophie, thank you so much for joining us and uh, really look forward to, to what you do next. And thanks for taking the time to um, come come along and get involved. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. Thank you, Arima. Thank you, Wando. And uh, I'm, I'm really, really grateful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Brilliant. 
Um, we're now going to go to our next speaker, Dr. Simon J. Cropper. I like this. There's a kind of double version of and a time delay. <laughs> two, two, I'm seeing two videos of myself. I'm going to introduce Dr. Simon J. Cropper, who's based in the Melbourne School of Psychological Sciences. Simon researches human sensation and individual differences in perception, including colour perception, the nature of hallucination, hallucination and the role that personality plays in what we see. So handing over to you, Simon. Thank you. Thank you, Arunma. Let me just see if this works. Can you see that? I think you can see it. Oh, yes, you can see it. Yeah. You can see me seeing me seeing that. Confusing enough as it is. Good. Uh, well, good afternoon to everyone there or wherever you are. It's actually morning here, early morning. And uh, there might be a five year old joining me. We'll see when he wakes up. Um, and thank you, Sophie and Wando, for really and interesting discussions and presentations. And I worry a little bit, I'm about to be a bit dull, so I'll try not to be. As I am in Australia, I'd like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, where I live, um, the traditional owners of the land where I spend my time. And uh, whilst there's a different type of constellation in this picture here, there I've been doing some work on indigenous astronomy and the, absolutely mind-blowing amount of knowledge that the Australian, in fact, many indigenous populations had about the relationship between the sky that they saw and the land that they lived on, and the way in which to observe and use that sky and its structure by extracting meaning from what is a remarkably sparse stimulus, um, in order to be able to survive in what often amounts to quite inhospitable environments. It, the more I find out about it, and the more people I talk to about it, the more phenomenal it truly is. And it's about time that we recognize that generally uh, in order to understand more about the planet we live on and maybe stop harming it quite so much. But it does have some relationship to what we're talking about, which is the idea that we construct our own reality and a reality where you have such a, uh, like a symbiosis in many ways, but also a dependence upon understanding what's happening way, way above you in this sort of almost unachievable uh, sense of distance, which relates back to Arima's original question, and how that dictates your day-to-day -day life, uh, and it's, uh, it's a really interesting question. What I'm going to talk about today is how uh, the work that I've been doing recently um, relates to the kinds of things that Wando has been doing from her perspective and from her practice, and how remarkably similar they are, although I think Wando does it way better than I do, um, in terms of trying to understand how different people see the world. And I'm also, I'm sort of going to present it in many ways, in a way that I presented it to my students when I first challenged them with this, the idea that everyone does have their own version of the world, and whether we're dreaming, hallucinating, or existing in something that we believe to be our own reality, they're all I think they're all similar states along the same continuum and they're just a product of the brain doing its job and its job is to make sense. That's what it is. It's a sense maker. It will do whatever it can to make sense of whatever comes in. And I've always felt that art and artists tell us a whole lot more about this than often they're given credit for or we often realize I think Wando again is a really good example of this. It's been a long held question in philosophy back to Bishop Berkeley and probably before that, but I've always sort of found this you know, one of <laughs> Nietzsche's very various, various versions of the same thing as he often did, but quite a pithy little uh, um, phrase that he has that the apparent world and the true world means the world and nothing which of course is the one extreme end of the argument about what is reality, that it's entirely in your head and nowhere else, which then uh, raises the question of the existence of the brain at all anyway. Uh, but it's something that I think that I certainly get the students to consider when they first come into psych, um, because I think it's important that you have to consider the, you know, the two poles of an argument from being, yes, there's a physical world out there and we do our very best to work out what's in it and that's, you know, that world exists right up to the fact that the whole thing is just a construct of the brain. And there are many aspects of vision research, which is my background, that are far, leaning far more towards the 
the Nietzsche end than the Platonic end of there being a real world out there. Um, and that's always been something that I felt has been increasingly relevant in the work I've done. And I started off principally in color vision and color vision is one of those areas of uh, psychology and vision science where there's this strange conflict between it being one of the most finely quantitative versions of vision science, measuring inputs down to nanometers of wavelengths and all sorts of things. Yet it is the arguably the simplest sensation that we have. We are unable to actually communicate it completely to anybody else. Our sensation of color is unique to each one of us. And we've developed a whole set of terms entirely for the communication of color, which is critical in our understanding of our world and the way that we communicate it to each other, but indicative of the fact that we have to use a word specific, specific to that sensation in order to communicate it rather than being able to share it directly. So that sensation is unique to each individual, which when you look at the sort of the basic process of vision, how we see, is perhaps not so surprising right from color up to actually everything that we uh, perceive. That's how everyone's world starts. It's a load of numbers. The output of your photoreceptors are a graded potential and that is what the brain has to make sense of. That's its job. So that might seem completely meaningless, but then at some point in the process of whatever individual is using that set of numbers, it becomes something meaningful. In that case, it's Gulliver who is not yet awake, but could be soon. Um, and it's hardly surprising that if that, that the process in each individual's brain goes from that set of numbers to whatever it is they're looking at, that they're, and given that the wiring is unique for each person anyway, that there are individual differences and versions of the world which come about. Now, largely, we have quite similar versions of the world, and we do the best job we can communicating them to one another. But that tends to ignore a lot of the subtleties. And even in, you know, between two people who don't have a noticeable and uh, easily described, not necessarily easily, but well described difference in their versions of the world, there will be significant differences, which given, I suppose, depending on how long you might spend with somebody, you will find out that you will see things quite differently. Colors are another good example of that. People are always arguing about colors because the slightly different uh, distribution of wavelengths that each, ind each individual is sensitive to. And I, I was trying to remember when doing this, when did I first sort of click that this is what artists were often trying to say and show, and scientists <laughs> are not often very good at listening to that, or certainly weren't. Um, and uh, I think it must have been some time ago when I was visiting the Tate when I was back in the UK. So it would have been 20, 30 years ago. And um, I realized that so many of the things I was looking at were actually more suggestions of what was out there rather than some photorealistic version. And the post-impressionists are a really you know, clear example of that. And it was an, obviously an important part of the way that they worked. And I've always quite liked this quote by Cezanne, that the eye's not enough, one needs to think as well. And just looking at his work and many other people's work, so much of what's there is suggested rather than clearly described and presented. So it's sort of, it's not a kind of, here it is, look at this. It's like, here are some suggestions, put this together for yourself. So there's a, there's a demand on, in, on behalf of the viewer that they actually do some work in creating what they're saying. And the artist is saying to them, you know, it's not just, you know, you're not just a passive viewer of this, you're, you're active in it, which is something that clearly Wando's taken to um, orders of magnitude more, uh, more, more suggestive. Um, and I do remember quite clearly seeing Bridget Riley's work for the first time, and I was already interested in colour and how we saw it. And the way that she uses color and structure to create pieces that don't even stay still. I mean, this is the, you, it's not even as if it's just a static piece of paper. There's movement in it, there's all sorts of things in it. And the color bleeds and moves and flows into one another. And the way that that happens for each individual has to be unique. 
to that. And it was I, I, it was quite a turning point, I think, for me, because I was you know, at the time looking at the, the very uh, the quite low level mechanisms and color detection and discrimination and trying to uh, using psychophysics, actually try and work out what's going on at a neural level. And then I looked at this and thought, well, how, what on earth am I doing? Am I going to be able to do this at all? And you know, we don't know the answer even now after hundreds of years of looking at it. Um, but it was sort of quite a, an eye opener for me and something that I've always uh, taken with me since then and actually integrated more specifically into the work I've been doing as I've become a little less narrowly focused on visual perception and a bit more on well how do we create reality how do we extract meaning in the world and what even what is meaning what is meaningful because what's meaningful to me might not be meaningful to somebody else and a sort of a more recent and I think quite remarkable example of the same kind of thing is James Turrell's work with light and color and the the things that this is him uh, stood outside the the bit of Arizona desert I think he owns where he's making an installation I think he believe he's still making it, which one day I want to go and see, where the as he says we think we receive all that we perceive and in fact we actually give the sky its color because we give the sky its color as in the sky space here I'm talking about the Arizona desert, I can make the sky any color you choose which is such a sort of uh, beautiful bombshell into color perception that it's, uh, you know, I constantly come back to that. And again, when trying to get students to sort of, I suppose, get interested in color perception in all of its, uh, all of its minute details, asking them to think about this and then think about color perception suddenly makes it a whole lot more interesting because it's not as obvious. And again, a few years ago now, this came up, which still has sort of some currency, certainly when you're doing lectures, which is the dress, which was a horrible photo of a horrible dress, but still raises an argument about with how you see the colours in that dress. Do you see black and blue or white and gold? And there are so many things. So there's been some specific work done on this to try and work out how we do it. No, we don't know why that's the case. It's a bit of an anomaly as then yes, color, color perception is very subjective and color language is very restricting, but to have such an apparently contrasting view of exactly the same image, which people will argue about and did argue about and still do in a lecture theater um, is quite remarkable from the point of view of a vision scientist when you're trying to get people to understand that, yep, your view of the world is actually your view of the world and nobody else's because here's a quite demonstrable example of exactly that. So whilst, yeah, it was annoying and we don't, I wasn't particularly interested in what Kanye thought about it, it certainly still remains probably absolutely the best example of this. There's been many wannabe copies of it, but this complete accident still is the best one and is really useful in terms of considering that question of like, well, is the world that you see the same as the world that I see, which then comes back to the whole you know, philosophical question of do we all see the same red, et cetera. Um, so sort of related to that, but also sort of related to you know, some work I was doing with a PhD student at the time and um, the idea about, well, how does an individual affect what they see and what sort of level of that perception is that effect coming in so obviously you know your, your life experience sort of all of these things that previously have contributed to who you are make who you are right now and what you know that affects and how you respond to things and your views on all sorts of you know, socio-political issues but does it affect how you see stuff and uh this became this was you know became more interesting to me and we wondered whether we could measure it and as a sort of a attack onto that can we actually say whether people are, you know, people who do different things consistently, who are more creative, uh, do they see the world differently? And is that measurable? So this idea of measuring subjective reality was actually tricky to say, at least but we were far from the first people trying to do it in a quantitative way. And there had been previous approaches to it. We uh, developed a particular kind of stimuli, one which sort of uh, took into account the environment, the natural environment that our visual systems are evolved to detect. And 
which actually is mirrored quite nicely in the structure of the brain and the function of the brain and how that works. That kind of natural structure is consistent throughout in the way that you, know, you look at a bit of brain, it also looks like the middle of a cave and all sorts of things. So there's that same natural structure to the, to the, the, the processes involved. Um, and we use this idea of a false alarm, which was uh, convenient for us because it also meant we could actually measure what people were seeing. Um, using signal detection theory. And we've presented participants with unstructured random visual images. And this was just, there were students initially. We've done quite a lot of the people do it now, by now doing it. Um, and investigated this occurrence of false alarms, which is basically somebody saying something's there when it's not. It's like an hallucination, but you know, in a minute way, in a very short period of time to a specific stimulus that you give them. And in this way, these false alarms are an indirect, indirect way of exploring hallucinatory or in you know, the, the context of artists' creative experiences and interrogating the subject of reality. These were the simile that we used, which in this case are faces embedded in noise. And the difference in this, there's two critical differences which I think may helped it work quite well is that the noise itself is of a structure which is equivalent to the average statistics of the natural environment, which is kind of what the system has developed to and uh, responds best to. And we embedded the faces rather than just having a signal, the face and the noise, which is the background here, overlaid on top of one another, we actually varied the pixels according to whether it was a signal pixel or a noise pixel. And that we felt was more equivalent to making a false alarm internally where you make a false correlation between two bits of space and decide they are part of the same thing when in fact they're not. And it's sort of like a, a kind of a, a sort of a backdrop to this is we also took the approach that signal and noise are basically the same thing, whether in the context of the brain and in its processing, uh, it ends up being what's considered signal or noise is entirely dependent upon whether one neuron affects the neurons it's connected to. That's all the brain does. It has neurons, they're connected to one another, they affect one another. Um, and so what could be signal to one neuron because it does have an impact upon its output, which then impacts its connections, could be noise to another neuron because it might just not have an impact upon that neuron and go, yep, not interested, not passing that signal on. So each of those minute processes are tiny decisions. And taking that approach sort of allowed us to uh, look at whether people were able to discriminate whether a face was present, as in these, and these are different levels of noise, or absent, as in uh, just a noise field, and then measure whether people were so similarly sensitive to all of these stimuli or whether it actually depended on the individual. And a kind of a broad summary of that, which sort of moves into looking at uh, uh, the kind of stuff that we're trying to look at now, is that seeing that meaningful image in the noise is correlated to personality and is correlated to the level of creativity and creative output of the individual or creative activity of the individual in their day to day life. The results are consistent with an increased internal noise level, which is consistent with quite a lot of other things actually. Artists interrogate their perception far more carefully, it seems, and they tend to make fewer false alarms, but only after a little bit longer of examination of the input. And they we're talking about, you know, they were presented for a second, but artists tend to take a little longer to respond and often would report that, yeah, I did see something, I thought something was there, but then I thought again about it and realized it wasn't. So they're tending to, they're actually using their day-to-day -day practice to respond in the experiment and look at it and go, no, no, there's nothing there. Whereas someone who isn't an artist, who isn't used to doing that all the time with everything they see um, or hear is, is basically just responding far more immediately going, yes, I see something. We we're trying to look at currently whether that sort of extraction of meaning actually kind of goes up the hierarchy from being a simple perceptual meaning to something to do with semantic relationships or insight problem solving. And it seems initially you know, preliminary data indicates that actually that, that kind of predisposition to extracting meaning perhaps a little bit more liberally and maybe a little bit easier does tend to hold across different levels of meaning, which is quite interesting. 
but it does give us some indication of this me measurably different subjective realities of the world. I mean, we can kind of say, yeah, everybody is seeing a different version of the world. Now, the vast majority of the time with most people, we probably either discount it, it isn't that important, it's not something that even comes up. We don't necessarily have to discuss everything that we see with everyone else. And even if we could, the language is probably sometimes so limiting that we can't even manage to explain what it is we're saying. But we felt like it does, it really does suggest that not only do people uh, have these unique versions of the world and we can measure it, artists do seem to be dealing with that uniquely different version of the world differently, which is consistent with kind of what they do all the time and have something to say about that. Which comes to distorted constellations by Wando which is, um, now I think I might be the only person here who's actually seen it in Melbourne because it was in the Science Gallery, which is downstairs in the building I work. And um, it was it was quite remarkable actually because I'd sort of heard about it and Wanda and I had talked about it and I think I'd seen some videos of it online. But when I went into the exhibit to sort of work out how we were gonna do the, the questionnaire stuff, uh, it was, you know, the, as with so many pieces of art, seeing it in online or pictures or descriptions of it, do not do it justice. And it was one of the most, um, like I agree with everything that everybody sort of says about it. So, but one of the things that I found was intensely hypnotic. It kind of, there are fragments of, you know, I don't experience visual snow and it's something that I've only, you know, only relatively recently since meeting Wando, but then also since meeting Wando, other people have said to me, oh yeah, I have visual snow or and since going to the exhibition in Melbourne have come out of it saying, oh, that's interesting. I thought every, you know, I was the only one that had this. Um, it, there are fragments of it, in fact, quite a lot of it, which is very like day-to-day -day perception and just stuff that you kind of, you, know, you don't really think about where you sort of think oh no, that's not particularly pleasant because you, know, you might be a bit tired or whatever and it's that kind of this is something I think I've always felt about artists they're able to sort of look into what they how they perceive the world and then pick out bits which they have a really strong sense people will actually see it's like the perfect metaphor by a writer the perfect metaphor as far as I'm concerned is something that when you're when you read it, it's like how beautifully and brilliantly that metaphor works, yet you have never heard it before and you wouldn't have thought about it yourself. But as soon as you're, it's suggested to you, it's like, that's it. That's exactly right. In you know, that kind of, it's a suggestion, but it's enough of a suggestion to pick up those, those threads, if you like, in the carpet of somebody else and put them together. And that's something that I really felt strongly about distorted constellations and went, kept, went down quite a few times just to stand in the middle of it and uh, be assailed by everything there. And I have to admit, I really like the rhythmicity of it as well, but that's because yeah. I kind of like that stuff. What we were interested in um, was to get a sense of, well, I, you know, I, I feel like when, you know, when I was thinking about this, what did we really want to know? Is the thing about something like this is it's, in, it's in inherently exploratory. And also the worst thing you can do, and scientists have an awful habit of doing this, is to take something that's really interesting and then bookend it with some really dull stuff, which really spoils the interesting thing in the middle. Synesthesia has to be absolutely the best example of that. It's fantastic. But every little tiny bit of science that seems to be done on synesthesia, synesthesia takes away the beautiful subjectivity of it and turns it into something which is sort of frustratingly objective and therefore not very interesting anymore. Maybe I'm being a bit harsh on synesthesia there, but it's something, I suppose it's, again, it's something that I find so intensely wonderful and I'm incredibly jealous I don't have it. But we wanted to know how visitors responded to the experience, but without spoiling the experience for them. So it is simple and exploratory, and I feel like I'm, you know, I spent too much time around psychologists having to, having to apologize for that exploratory nature, but I'm not apologizing, I'm just telling you. Um, whereby we asked some, some simple, quick questions that they answered on their phone before, immediately before they went into the exhibit, which was that it was in the, in, in the science gallery. It was a, an exhibition called Mental, which had lots of different uh, exhibits which challenged people's view of, I think, norm normality, really, and whether you know, mental as a sort of a, 
a slang term was at all valid. And it's really good. And distorted constellations were sort of quite a big piece towards the back. So people had done generally tended to wander through, do these other things, and then come to distorted constellations. We gave them um, three quick questions before. They went, <clears throat> they went into the exhibit and then three quick questions afterwards, then an open-ended question about, you know, is this uh, equivalent to anything that you've experienced? The questions were, do you think what you see in here is an accurate reflection of what's out there? Do you think everyone experiences the same sensory world? And do you think there's such a thing as normal? So all very much related to the same thing. They could answer yes, no, and maybe, which I know everyone's going to go, oh, you shouldn't have done maybe, but why not? Um, here a plot in there, it is really basic, very descriptive or barely descriptive statistics, because you know, arguably it's not the kind of thing to do statistics on anyway, but also the exhibition's only recently closed, and so this is as far as we got. Um, what we look, have here, a plot of the number of responses, just the raw frequency against the three different options, no, maybe, and yes. Before the individual went into the or before the individuals went into the exhibition and afterwards, this is what you see in here is an accurate reflection, accurate reflection of what's out there. Apologies for it being cut off. And one thing that you know is really noticeable here that prior to the exhibition, there was more yeses than nos, and maybes tended to be more than both of them. But after going through distorted constellations. A significant number of people changed their response from either maybe or yes to no, as in no, now I don't think what I see in here is what's actually out there or an accurate reflection of what's out there. So they're changing their category after experiencing distorted constellations, which I thought was pretty neat, actually. It's had an effect on everyone that's well, not everyone, but a significant number of people that have been to see it. We had 347, I think it was, completed surveys. We actually had 700 surveys, not all of which were complete. And that was, there were more people who went through. Not everyone had to do the survey, obviously. Here we've the questions, do you think everyone experiences the same uh, version of the world? And this, <clears throat> excuse me, surprised me in that so many people said no. I kind of expected more people to go, yes, you know, the world's a bit boring, it's out there, we're just looking at it. And it pleased me as well. I was uh, happy that that's indeed is what people said. Admittedly, they had been through the rest of the exhibition. Some of them were my students, so of course they were going to say no. But uh, that was, you know, I think quite a nice response. And equally, do you think there's such a thing as normal? Which again, the, the whole of the Science Gallery exhibition was about. But you know, the, the point of it was to ask people and maybe get them to question like, no, there isn't normal. Normal's a construct that we tend to use to help explain things, I suppose, and that's understandable, but it is, can also be problematic when there's an expectation that yes, people are gonna behave normally. And then if they don't, we're gonna have, you know, discriminate against them in some way. We're not great with differences until we see a distinct advantage in them. And that's quite a problem. So again, I was quite pleased that there was this, uh, do you think there's, some, there's such a thing as normal? And the vast majority of people said no. And more people said no after the um, experiencing distorted constellations. Simon, sorry to um, interject. We only have about six minutes left of the session. Right. <clears throat> it's possible I'm to come to a quick conclusion. Yes, yes, I'm coming to the conclusion. So did it remind you of any experience you have? which in most of this is the uh, most in interesting bit. Uh, and the major themes were migraine aura, psychedelics, nightclubs, music festivals outside at night, dreams and sleeping, anxiety and feelings and panics, and thunderstorms and rain. So all of the things that you might think, well, it, that maybe seems obvious, but to actually have that as a consistent set of themes coming out, particularly the migraine, because my, there's been a fair bit of work done on migraine, that similarity it's worth looking at, as with psychedelics. One of the nicest responses I felt was when somebody said, yes, this is almost an exact representation of what I experienced. And I thought I was alone in this. And from what Wanda said, there's quite a few people who said that, which means it's, it's really, it's changing people's lives when they get that kind of affirmation and reassurance of what's going on. And I think given the time, I was only going to show some silly pictures there. So um, I'll end it there. But just to say that it's not only is it an absolute pleasure to do something like this, and I want to do more of it. Um, I just want to thank Wando, Arinma, and Sophie 
for, for involving me on this. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Wanda, if we come to you with a question for Simon and then Erica will come to the audience in Toronto for the final question and then we'll close. Yeah, uh, I mean, we could even go to if there's an audience question, we can we can go to that. Sorry, I was just I was just, I was just really thinking about what was I was thinking about. Uh, OK, I mean, I guess actually the question I've got for Simon is if you could go back again and ask different questions. Because that's what I was thinking to myself. I was thinking, oh, would I want to ask different questions? I don't know. I mean, I was thinking this and I was thinking, oh, you know, it's kind of the fact the questions are so similar is in terms of a psychological questionnaire structure is it's not standard not great but that's not really what it was so I think it was a kind of trying to get a context of the individual so what changed that individual before they went in and afterwards and I was so I remember when we talked about it, I was quite aware it's got to be really quick and really simple so because they're there to see distorted constellations they're not there to answer questions that I'm going to ask them um Actually, I'm, I'm not sure. Certainly none leads to mind. There was nothing that I felt like, oh, I wish I'd asked them that. Yeah. What I am really interested in is, and I'm glad we asked them, is their interest in doing further work. And we've got 68 people who are interested in doing further work and getting them to come back. Quite a few of who wow. have said, yeah, it's like this. And then we can actually you know, talk to them more. And I want to show them the faces in noise to see if they respond differently to the faces in noise. Because if you've got this constant overlay of noise, which is naturally there in the all version of the world, and then you're doing giving you a signal to noise discrimination task, that is going to have an effect, I think. And so you know, having those 68 people hopefully want to come back and do something a little bit more detailed and specific related to what they experienced in distorted constellations is... I think the most useful thing. I think but that's I, fascinating because that's like that's that is a self-selecting group that that means, yeah. means some, what does it mean? Who are these people that have all they've got something particular from this experience? What what is this group of people? Oh yeah, that's that is fascinating. Wow, that sounds so, it does sound fascinating. I'm gonna have to stop us because um, let's see if there's a question from the audience and then we will need to wrap up. Sorry to interrupt, uh, Erica. Any final questions? From folks out here looks like we're good here if you okay. want to wrap it up yeah um so i mean just some quick i don't want to summarize because it's been such a wonderful and wide-ranging conversation a couple of things that really stood out for me was this idea that signal and noise are the same thing. <laughs> when I used to do electrophysiology, I did wonder about this, and it's really interesting to hear this from you on the psychological side. A control of one from Sophie. We also heard the possibility of new experiments. So uh, how what could virtual reality combined with brain scanning um, create? And, and, and Wando, it would be great to hear from you your thoughts on that. Wando, you really um, opened up for me this idea of thinking about colour in a very different way um, and then linking that back to what Simon presented us. We've had these remarkable insights um, to um, a brilliant site, Distorted Constellations of Art and Science Experiment and the ways in which it has shaped people's understanding of the self and reality. Wando, I wanted to hold a hand over to you for the final word um, about um, this, but I hope that this has offered people the opportunity to see what a more inclusive cognitive science might become. Wando, last word to you. Oh, I just really want to say thank you to all of you for, for, for being part of this journey. It's been a really incredible way for me to explore, to explore myself and reality. And I'm just, I just love that it can continue to, to, to do that for other people. So thanks. Brilliant, thank you. And to wrap up, um, this session has been brought to you by um, a platform called Open Light, which I founded during lockdown, uh, informed by a poet, poem by Audre Lorde uh, called Coal. And uh, it's an exchange platform for artists, cultural entrepreneurs and researchers, and it's supported by Welcome and UKRI NERC, the Natural Environmental Research Council in the UK. Um, Wando, I think your work has been supported by Unlimited and Arts Council and Space and a whole range of other venues. Um, so thank you to you for listening and thank you to all of our speakers and thank you, Erica, for keeping us to time.
good night or good morning good in Simon's <laughs> side of the world. Good morning. En enjoy your breakfast and good morning to your son. <laughs> Thank you. Bye.